Okay, I got it now. So even though the next, the first eight weeks after this is gonna be all about positional chess, today we're gonna to be do, splitting this class up in half. The first half is gonna be on candidate moves and the latter half is on pure calculation. I'll explain the difference now, but I'll kind of go into it a little bit more in depth later. The, the big difference between candidate moves and calculation is for candidate moves, you're just trying to come up with the first few moves that come up with your head into your head and trying to pick the one that makes the most amount of sense. Calculation is you're just going deep down one line. That's it. So a candidate moves is like a branch. You have like four or five different options and you're picking it based off of something that stands out. We'll talk about how we pick those ideas. And then for calculation, you're just going deep, a few moves deep down one specific line. And we'll talk about that. Most of the time I'm gonna have players' names here, unless I couldn't find it. So this, this game, I couldn't find the players, but everything else, it's on the left. So afterwards, if you want, you can find those games online. Uh, they're going to be uh, publicly available. So why don't we start off with this position? Um, so it's going to be black to play. And I like picking positions to start off that are kind of in the middle game. That's my expertise. And it's late middle game or almost end game, right? A lot of pawns have been traded off. Two minor pieces are gone. And if we look at it, the position seems fairly balanced. What are some candid moves? So just some top moves that just enter your head, you're black. I don't want to give any hints. Just give me some moves and I'm just going to put them out and then we're going to, don't be afraid to give me the wrong answer. In fact, I want the wrong answer right now. So just what are some moves that, that intrigue you here that you would play yourself? Okay, we got, we, we got E5. Yeah, absolutely. Knight E5 for sure. Knight D5, okay. And we're, we're actually going to look at all of them in no specific order that everyone gives me. Queen C2, Knight B6. Is there any other move that I... Oh, Rook D8, sure. Um, G5, sure. So, I mean, this is a pretty good list. I mean, we came up with, what is it, like eight, eight moves, seven moves? Pretty Queen E5. After, I mean, after some point, it's not necessary. I mean, the whole point of candid moves is just having a few. If we just have a ton, it's most of the moves like that don't do anything, it's not worth considering. So if if we're under the position that a move like, let's say, King H8 is something we're considering, it's probably not going to lead to anything. So we want to, the tip, especially for today, is try to look for aggressive, active moves, moves that do something, H5. Okay. Actually, you know what? Let, let I'll go through the moves backwards. Let's start off with the move h5 this move is interesting let's pretend that we're white and black has just played the move h5 against us do you think that this is something that we should be worried about whatever black's plans is with h5 or do you think we have to react to it what do you guys think does h5 have some sort of threat that we have to worry about or is there nothing here and we could just do our own thing okay Yeah, I, I, I would probably, I would probably agree with all of you. H five on its own doesn't really threaten anything. Nothing that we should really be worried about. So that means that we have the ability to do whatever we want. And I like the idea of activating my knight, probably just bringing it into the game. Even this knight trade is good for us because now with this H palm push, king's a little bit more exposed. Maybe we can bring in our bishop to attack. Maybe our knight's going to come in here. Not something we're worried about. So H five generally not something we're worried about. Okay, queen e5 is a very basic idea, very, very logical one, right? We just want to trade queens. That's what black's thinking. Does Is white welcoming a trade of queens or do you think white wants to avoid it in this position? And tell me why. Tell me why we'd either welcome it or why we'd want to avoid it in these kind of positions. Right, you guys, you're actually mentioning a lot of good points here. Um, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to talk about all of them. Black has just put their queen on a very good square. Obviously, there's no debate about that. This queen is very nice. We could avoid it. We could also accept it. Here are a few responses that you guys gave me. We should just avoid it. Um, a lot of you are worried about the structural change that will happen, right? If we do nothing, they're going to take, and that means that we might have double pawns, might not be something we want. And conversely, if we take the queen, that means we activate their knight. So maybe we'd want the queens off, but the problem is we're going to make some concessions if we trade queens. Uh, on the other hand, we have a wide open bishop. Usually bishops do best when there's less material on the board. That's how they're able to, pro to prove their dominance over knights. Um, but in this position, the bishop isn't doing that much. I, I would say queen e5 is, there's many different ways for white to react. Um, I, like, I like specifically putting pressure on the b5 pawn because it's an uh, isolated pawn. What moves do you think white should play to play against a move like queen e5? By the way, that doesn't mean we should avoid it or we can't. If there's some tactical shot of playing against b5, that's, that's something we should consider, especially if the queen's b is going here. The problem with a move like queen b4 is that maybe we have to worry about the rook coming in. Right, because suddenly the rook becomes nice and active. There, there's some mild pressure on that, but there's now suddenly two pieces attacking the b2 pawn. I never, I never specifically said that we have to avoid trading queens. Even if we mildly damage our pawn structure, if we remove, if we trade off the B pawns, it's going to be better for white, the position, because the position is going to be more wide open. Yeah, taking is completely fine here. And how can we now put pressure on this pawn? We want to do it in ways that make defending it or dealing with the pressure uncomfortable. Right, so rook b7 is a fair move, but they probably have rook b8. And so now they probably want to trade off the rooks. And even if we reinforce it, that means we're no longer really putting pressure on b5. I mean, white is probably doing fine. Which one? So there's two rooks that can go to a specific square. Make sure you tell me which one. Clarify. A, a, a lot of people, when they may, when they even write no, uh, their moves on score sheets, they forget to write which piece goes where, especially when there's two options. Um, rook seven e5 is fine, but this rook is kind of active. I, I want to bring the first rook to a5. We don't have to worry about our back rank because the king can always move up. So I kind of like the idea of going in here and taking the pawn. I mean, I would say after rook c2, the position's around even. And that's completely fine for white. This position, something like this. They can take, we take back. They're probably going to take our pawn. Maybe we have a pass pawn here. And becomes a very, I would say it's like two-sided. It really, it's either white's playing for the win or it's going to be a draw. We also are able to, if we want to, apply more pressure to this pawn. White's knight hangs on d2. That's true, but the black's knight's hanging on e5. So if they take our knight, I mean, we could ultimately trade a lot of material here. And we get that position I was talking about, the good bishop against the knight. Again, it's one of those two result games. Either white's going to win this or it's going to be a draw because our bishop is absolutely dominating this knight. Look at your opponent's active squares. That's something I'm always going to be encouraging you to think about, especially in this class. Consider your opponent's active ideas. And our bishop is obviously dealing with all of them. Maybe even g4 is a good move. Okay, so not, not queen e5. Uh, pawn on one side. I mean, I, I don't know if that's apt. I mean, that's true, Richard. I would agree. So pawn on one side of the board is better in general for the knight. But in this position specifically, our bishop is doing such a great job against the knight. And the knight doesn't have a lot of active squares. So sure, if we had a pawn here and our bishop was supporting it, that would be amazing. But even though we don't have it, white's position is still better than black's. And we're trying to do better than barely hold on with the black pieces. So queen, if we if we putting ourselves in this position where we're barely holding on, it's not optimal. Um, okay, what what other move did we consider? Okay, so g five. 
right. This is this is a very interesting move. Um, if we look at it, it weakens the king. But what is the only move for white here that doesn't lose material? White only has one move. Uh, David, that's right. Anyone else? It lo looks like our queen is almost trapped right in the center of the board. The knight is blocking the queen. Luckily, or maybe not really luckily, the queen has an escape square, which is what? I mean, it's, uh, the square is not going to be an ideal square to be, to be fair, but it's the only move that's going to be available. Right, we can we slide our back, queen back to e3. And now, why is this not something white wants? Why not? Because what will black do in this position? It'll take. Yeah, can you type uh, type the answer for me? Oh, sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, we can take, and now we give white doubled ice lay pawns. These pawns are completely damaged. And not only are these pawns damaged, it's also black that plays first in this position. So we change the position up here. Let me flip the board. How should black play here? Again, look for aggressive moves. And in this case, we could just deliver a double attack to basically win material. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Everyone is right. Rook C2, and we're winning a pawn. Now, if we look, the other moves just don't accomplish as much. If, okay. Some questions. If they play b4, uh, what uh, what move should? Actually, maybe I should ask a question. Is queen takes a7 a good move here for black? Make trying to make an in between move to win the queen. No, it doesn't work because white can make an in between move, and they can take the pawn with check, and then they'll take our queen. However, black has a different in-between move here, which is what? What's a different in-between move here for black that wins material? Yeah, Leo, you're absolutely right. Arkady, David. Yeah. We can attack our opponent's king with the move queen c1. If they don't take, you just take the queen for me. And obviously if they take, we'll take back and then we'll pick up the queen. If we consider the other moves that were provided, I mean, these moves are just slow improving moves and they're not really accomplishing anything. Sure, we're improving our rook a little bit. Knight b6, obviously I can't say too, too many bad things about it. We're trying to go towards the center. Um, queen c2, it's hitting the pawn, but the pawn could probably just advance. White is doing completely fine here. The one other moment is e5. It seems to be just as aggressive, but why does e5 not work as well as g5 here? Here, white is able to deal with it in a better way. How will white play against the move e5? I mean, there's a few options, but always look for a move that creates, that's the most aggressive, that gives your opponent the most amount of trouble. Leo, Leo is right, yeah. 100% agree. We're take, we want to take advantage of the light squares. We, we're the only one that has the bishop. Our bishop's on light squares. That should be the emphasis. And so here, we're going to do that in this position. Surely we could go queen h4. We can go queen g5. But queen f5 is that instinctual move that you should consider right away. We're con considering this battery, maybe with knight e4, we're hitting the knight on d7. We're giving a lot of problems for black. So the best move is the move G5. It, it is the move that just wins on the spot. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, okay, let's do, this. let's do this position. Before I even ask for candid moves, it is white to play. What is black threatening? What is black threatening? It's wise to make sure you are aware of your opponent's threat. They are threatening maiden one, knight f2. So if we make some random move, 
the threatening main one. Okay, let's come up with some candidate moves to deal with the threat. Now we could be playing our in-between move. Maybe we could attack the king, but knight f2 is we have to keep it in the back of our heads. Okay. So what are some what are some moves? And give me your wrong moves. Just give me the first moves that come to your mind. Uh, bishop d3, certainly. It's white to play, yeah. Queen h7, of course. Taking the knight, yeah. Queen f8. If, if you have any moves that I haven't put in there, please feel free. Queen g6, sure. H3. I mean, yeah, I know this king looks like it's almost mated. I, I just want to point out before we get too deep into the weed of things that like queen g6 just doesn't work. They can just take it. Uh, although that would be a nice way to just finish the game instantly. H4. H4, also, I really like this idea as it removes the square, but we're getting mated ourselves. Yeah, bishop d3 was already given. Okay, I think we, I mean, we have a pretty, pretty good amount. The the first thing that should always we should always think about are checks in this position. I mean, the king's almost made it. It's like so close. As we notice here, the king is able to run away. And if we kept if we keep checking him, either the bishop is going to hang or the king just keeps running. In fact, in this position, there's just like no good checks. Any queen check would result in the hanging bishop. And a pawn check, the queen just takes. So we we just we just run, we run out of good moves here. Shockingly, black is safe. And they're still threading that maiden one. Of course, taking the knight is not what we want. We're pinned. It's, it's going to take us a while to get that bishop into the game. Of course, there's nothing here. Um, let's look at other very aggressive moves. Queen f8 check, again, falls into that same issue. I just go here, and you have no good checks. There's, not, there's nothing good, and I'm still, I still have that same threat. Um, the other move was bishop d3. Uh, queen f8 here, queen takes c5. You are stopping knight f2, but then your bishop's hanging. So even though you could take my knight, for instance, and then take the pawn, even if we would agree that this position is not winning for black, you're definitely not achieving anything because black is not losing, right? Black is at worst holding. At best, they might just be winning on this pawn. Maybe there's, there's going to be some way for them to mate us. Uh, Bishop d3, this doesn't uh, really accomplish much. This one check is not that menacing. I can just move my rook over, and you can give me this check. And I might be able to even hide here. Uh, yeah, Richard, that's, the goal is for white to win. Yeah. Like, you can go check, and there's actually no good checks anymore. The king is shockingly safe on h3. Uh, the one move that kind of points into that right direction is creating escape squares for your own king. So a move like h3. But uh, in this position, I think black can play can black play this move. Yeah, I, I don't see why not. First of all, I think I think black has a few good choices, but maybe even knight e3 is fine. I don't see a way that instantly wins. And we're stealing, we're still dealing with the issue that our bishop is pinned. I want to change your focus here a little bit. Try to create an escape square for your king that also threatens mate. So you want to try to do two things at once. A lot of you are just saying, okay, how do I mate him? But you're forgetting about your own king's safety. How can you try to threaten your opponent's king, but at the same time dealing with the threat that your opponent has on your king? I think a lot of you have that light bulb moment, and now everyone that has typed anything in the last 30 seconds has given me the right answer. How, I'll repeat myself. How can we give our king that escape square? But at the same time of giving our king the escape square, we're going to be able to threaten mate. Yeah, what, what, as I said, what's trying to win? This position is completely winning for Wayne. We would love to play h4. We would love to because h4 completely sandwiches their king, but we're unable to do that in this position because they take it. So we're going to play the move g3. Now, what is the point of g3? Let's say black just does absolutely nothing. Let's say they just go b5. What was the point of g3 to do what? 
we have a mate, a forced mate here. It's a maiden two. So a lot of you are falling for queen h7, h4. This is not a mate. I mean, we're probably winning the rook, but this there's no mate here. The king is able to run away. And in fact, we might have to be worried about our own king's safety. Uh, this is the, the ideal way of mating is queen fhf. Because the, now the only move is king g5, in which case we do what? Yeah, Richard, you're 100% right. Yeah, Arkady, you're right, yeah. What is the maiden one in this position? Queen g7, not a mate, because our bishop's hanging. The pawn is on h2 currently. Yes, no, it's all good, it's all good. As I said, the best time to make mistakes is right now. You got nothing to lose. You got nothing to lose, h4. H4 is checkmate. So the whole point of G3 is there's two points. A, after knight F2, we're completely safe here. But more importantly, we're playing G3 to support this H4 move. So we want to go check and mate. If they kick us out with the with the rook, they're now actually removing their king's escape square. So we have this made in two that we didn't previously. The king's position is absolutely sandwiched by their own pieces. So G3. Mildly counterintuitive, but when you think about it a little bit more, it really makes sense. The basic thought is, where's the mate? We got to just go check, 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 and then it's mate. But this is not a beginner class. I urge you to consider multiple things. Your own king safety, while also dealing with creating that blow for your opponent's king. So G3 does both. Okay, so that, that was two middle games. Now let's do an end game. I'm a big fan of end games. Of course, I come from a Soviet family. That's I was raised with end games. I gotta say, I don't know how most of you uh, were learned were taught chess, but my father, he taught me how the pieces move, and then it was end games. That's all we did for like the first two years of my chess. So no openings, nothing. It was just absolute bare fundamentals and end games. So if I do too many end games with you and you hate me for it, I apologize in advance. Uh, it's white. Uh, it's going to be white to play in this position. Uh, did I? Yeah, yeah. How? How should? What are some moves that enter our mind here? What are some top moves? Where's H seven? A four. It seems like everyone is attracted to H7, so we have to take a look. Like I'm, I think we need to talk about H7. H7, it's the first move that comes to everyone's mind. We're one move away from queening. It seems like Black is going to resign. Their king is not even in time to try to mate us. But this position is actually a draw. Can someone tell me why? I love giving positions where everyone gets excited. They're like, oh, it's got to be this, but it's going to be so obvious. And then I give it to them and they and I just see the color leave their face. Rook C1 check. And there's actually no way to avoid the perpetual because our rook is going to be consistently hanging. We can go, let's say we move here. Okay. If we move our king out, they'll just take the rook and manage the pawn. So we have to defend it. Doesn't matter where, they go check again. We go back, it doesn't matter where, they go check. Does, and white now has to continuously defend the rook. And when we do that, that means black is able to deliver that perpetual. This king, this king on g5 is actually doing all the work of ensuring the king is, white king is not able to go anywhere. It's a draw. Shocking. Absolutely shocking. This shows the point, very important point of, uh, about any games that you guys all should be aware of. King activity, so important. So important. Um, so there's there's nothing nothing for white to do. This position is a draw. Okay, so I, I, we have to look at h7. I know I, I couldn't say don't look, think about h7. We have to just do h7 first. So no h7. We obviously want to promote our pawn. One of them. Um, what are some other moves that come to our mind? Hmm. 
Richard, very impressive. So if we go King G2, they have that same draw. They have that same perpetual because our king is continuously tied down to the rook. And we can't move our rook anywhere because then we lose the pawn. But maybe we can move our rook somewhere. Obviously, if we go here, this position is almost certainly a draw. A side pawn, even though this king is very cut off, this position is holding. Rook h5. The issue is this looks fancy because we stopped the rook from coming here, but they're able to come in from this way. The shocking move is that we realize that we have to use a rook to defend the pawn. And we're gonna move it to the most counterintuitive square. And the right answer is rook h1. Unbelievable. It's a shock. It's it really, you're just like, what? You're talking about activity and then you're gonna tell me rook h1? Like, are you an IM? I, yeah, I don't, know. I don't know how I got there either, to be honest. Rook h1, if they go check, and let's say they check again, we're no longer tied down to our rook anymore. How should white play? Absolutely, absolutely, uh, David, yeah, Leo, Arkady. Absolutely. Our king is attacked, but that is completely fine because we are able to run away. The question is where? We want to make sure that there's no perpetual. So you want to make sure that you run your king as far away from their king as possible. And in this position, we're able to do so. We just go king up three. I mean, okay, they can check us some more, but th these are not checks we're worried about. The king is too far away from the pawn. And by the time the rook deals with this pawn, we can just start rolling this guy out and support this pawn with our king. And it's an incredibly pleasant position. Now, here comes the very obvious question that probably a lot of you were thinking but didn't ask. Oh, also, if they go here, we can push right, to try to queen. Why can't they just go check and then take our rook and take the pawn? Isn't this position a draw? Or no? There's this concept, and Richard just noted it, it's called the rule of the square. And you, the way you draw it is, I mean, I'm, it's basically a triangle, but you, you draw it like this. And if your opponent's king is not able to reach it in time, uh, you're winning. And in fact, black is way behind. It's not even one move behind, it's much more, you'll see. So if we push, notice how black's king is not, it's not even remotely there. This king needs to fight all the way here. He needs to go three in one square. So he's not, he's not even remotely close. So even if it was in this position, uh, when they take our rook and then they take our pawn, even if it was black to play, they wouldn't be in time. Because really when we push our pawn, our square becomes much smaller. A lot of people forget that in chess, the pawn could go two squares forward. And the king cannot enter the square in two moves and it's three, so it's not in time. So even if it was black to play, it wouldn't be in time. So white is winning. With with the very shocking move rook h1, uh, I think just due to time. I mean, I could put in the answers to these later. I want to do calculate. If we have time, we can go back to candidate moves. But let's talk about calculation. And this is going to be an easy one. Here, I'm not looking for any candidate moves. I'm not looking for you to give me a bunch of moves. I want you to just think briefly. This is really warm up. This is going to be the easiest question I ask today. How does black win you and what makes this calculation not candid moves is i'm really just looking for one line i'm not looking for anything else i'm not looking for you to consider many different lines at the same time just one line and this this is like i want maybe two moves for black so i just want you to give me the next two moves for black in this position the white pawns are going this way black is about to promote but they're blocked the pawn is blocked by the rook Leo, well done. Yeah, Richard, perfect. Salim, yeah. Frank, Daniel, yeah, very good. Yeah, everyone's right. Everyone that has said anything is right. Don't be afraid to participate. As I said, like, you will take out the most from this class the more you say things, even if you're wrong. Don't be afraid to be wrong. I want to make it clear that 
you're gonna this is the best place to make mistakes You've got nothing to lose so the big issue is that the bishop is blocking their king if the bishop was gone we'd have this check and so we have this bizarre looking move almost slightly counterintuitive is to take the pawn and the problem is for white is that they have no way of taking it right if they take with the king we have this basic trick how can we promote our pawn here Rook d8 is here. So you want to make sure you always give the coordinate correctly. Rook d1 is not a check. Rook c1. Right, rook c1. And okay, the king moves anywhere. And queen. If the bishop takes, we just go one square further. And then we queen. And this position is winning. I want to make sure. Especially with the fact that this pawn's on a light square, where our king is going to be able to come in. I mean, even if it was on a dark square, it'd be winning. I don't know why I emphasize that. Well, the, the next question is, what if they don't take? Well, actually, that doesn't change anything. We want to take their bishop. Their bishop can't move because we're going to go rook check. If they just make some random move with the rook, we just take their bishop, and they're not safe. We can just do the same check to promote. The big issue in this position was that white's king was blocked by their bishop, and we're able to distract it by taking that pawn. Very nice tomb of calculation. Very good. Uh, why don't, actually, you know what? Let's go backwards. L let's do my game. So this is a game I played in 2019 against Peter Giannatos. He's, uh, he runs a successful chess club in America in North Carolina. And I was playing in a norm tournament in Montreal. And this was round eight. So going into round eight, I needed one and a half points out of two to get a norm. And I was white against Peter. And then I was black in the final round. I had beaten Peter. But I had lost in the last round, so I didn't even get my norm. It was quite, quite, uh, quite a fun ride home. Um, I actually did not find the winning tactic in this position. I think in this position, if you find the winning tactic, it's like plus five. And if you don't, the best move, which is what I played, the second best move is like plus half or something. I found the first move, but I wasn't able to find the whole line. Uh, I went on to win in a rook and bishop versus rook end game. It was a hundred move game. So the first move I will show, but then I'll ask you to calculate after that. I played the move rook d8. And obviously, he, he's not going to take because that just results in us taking. And then what will white play in this position? That's right. They're just going to end us. It's checkmate. Hopefully that wasn't too difficult. Uh, so there Black's not going to take, obviously. And my opponent is a, a fide master. I think he's like 22, 30. He's not going to blunder me. And when he's going to play king e7. And in this position, I had, I'll tell you what I played. I had taken, the, I took the rook, and then I went on to try to take his pawn. He went on to take my pawn. It was very unclear position. I was better, then I was worse. Then, and then we went into that rook and bishop versus rook end game, which initially was a draw, but then I was able to win in time pressure. Okay. Leo, you seem to be on the right track there. Yeah, you're very good. So how should white play here? Remember, I want you to look and think about the most aggressive moves here, the ones that give your opponent the most amount of issues. That's how you should always play chess, by the way. Whenever you're considering a move in chess, both for yourself and for your opponent, always look for the most aggressive move. If your opponent isn't able to do the most aggressive move, then that means you're probably okay most of the time, especially in these kinds of positions. Because structurally, black is doing better than white. White has this weak isolate pawn on e5. Wow, uh, Leo, well done. Yeah. So a basic rule of chess involves bringing new pieces into the game. You want to bring new pieces, not the old ones, new pieces. If we go rook eight to d7, we're not bringing in this rook at all. And so the king could just move up forward and they're probably okay. If we take the knight, black will welcome. Yeah, Daniel, that's right. Black will welcome such a trade because we just got rid of our active bishop for the knight that wasn't doing anything. And c3 is now hanging. Of course, we can win a7, but then they're going to take c3 and now our king's going to be weak. We always want to activate our weakest pieces. So in this position, it's this rook. They're going to go rook check. 
Okay, so here there's two moves to consider. Oh, you're right, taking the knight also hangs the rook. I, I even forgot to fail to mention that. That's probably even better than what I said. All right, okay, so check. They have two moves. They can take the rook and they can play king e6. Let's talk about taking the rook first, because this is easier. Why does taking the rook lose material? How should white play? Cutty, what's wrong? If we take the rook, they'll just move their king. And then they're going to take this pawn on e5. So even though we can take the pawn and we're threatening this fork, they'll take this pawn. Black is doing more than okay here. And also, this, as I like to emphasize, this weak pawn on c3. But if we take the rook on c8, there's a little bit of a problem here for black, a little bit of a wrinkle. Not only are we threatening the rook, we're also threatening the knight at the same time. Suddenly, it's a double attack. And if black tries to escape it with the move rook d2, what will white do here? What can white play? Yeah, Leo, that's right. David, yeah. Daniel, yeah. We are able to maintain the pressure with king e1, right? And suddenly, they're not holding. The knight moves, we take the rook. The rook moves, we take the knight. And the position collapses in on, on itself. Now, they can move their king up. Yeah, Arkady, that's absolutely right as well. The, probably a good emphasis is not only is everything here under fire, they're also having to deal with the main one, as if we are not putting enough uh, problems for them. Okay, so they're going to play king e6. Seems like a very logical move, advancing the king, hitting their pawn. But this is still very good for white. In fact, I saw everything except for how to deal with this position. So I assumed that there was nothing here. Arkady, you gave me the right answer, and then you disagreed with yourself. Salim, yes, that is right. Have more confidence. Yeah, uh, two people have given me the right answer here. Richard, yeah. It's actually, Michael, well done. It's the exact same idea that we spoke about, which makes not seeing it so much more embarrassing. If we had taken the rook on c8, they just take back. Uh, yeah, Leo, yours is right, yes. The right answer is rook e8 check. The, the point is that we distract their rook and we arrive at the similar position that we did before. When we take the rook, they're suddenly under this double attack. And I did not find this move. Certainly not an easy move to find when you're calculating four or five moves ahead to just throw away your rook. Not natural, especially in this position, because if I don't have rook e8, I'm almost losing because e5 is falling. And why did I just randomly activate his king? What was the point of all those checks? Uh, taking on c7. The, the issue, there's no mate here. Like, even if we go check, the king is able to run around. There's nothing here. It's, it's painful. And I, the issue is I had, I thought about this. This is where I thought the longest in the whole game. I, th I think I spent like 10 minutes. Didn't see anything. And I just played, okay, I said, all right, fine, check. I'll take the rook and I'll, I'll try to do some damage on the seven. It was not the, the best move. Let me ask... A little bit of a different question. Always what I, I've done so far is I have just given positions and I've asked you to solve them. But I'm going to ask you a different question here. Is this a good free pawn for white to capture? Can Should white capture the pawn on b5? And tell me why. Obviously saying yes or no gives you a 50-50 shot. You can just close your eyes and be lucky. So I would I'd beg for some, some effort. And don't just give me something general. I want some specific moves. Well, a check is not scary. I can just move my king up. A lot of you are just thinking, oh, there's a check on d2. 
Don't think so, basically. Just because there's a check on D2, that doesn't mean the game, game's over. I can move my king. Uh, yeah, Leo, that is the right answer. Well done. Remember, white is satisfied with a the draw. They have less space. Their pawn structure is a little bit worse. And black is much more active here. Obviously, it's opposite color bishop endgame. So queen trade is going to be favorable for white. But white is just happy with uh, a queen trade. They're also happy with perpetual. So if I can somehow invoke a perpetual, that would be great. So taking the pawn, I'm trying to get close to them. Arcadia, that is the right answer, yeah. I'll give everyone maybe one more minute, then I will talk about it. Remember, white is happy with the queen trade. So if you go queen c5, black is going to be really unhappy. I'm just going to take the queen. And even if I lose all these three pawns for this one pawn, it's going to be a draw in that bishop endgame. This is opposite color. A lot of opposite color bishop endgames are drawn. So this is... This is actually really important what someone said. I, it's really important to address. If I take the pawn, a lot of you, yes, yeah, okay, so I, it's good. Uh, I'm glad I got a lot of different variations. A lot of you, when you guys play chess, a lot of you fail to consider your opponent's ideas. If you play the move queen b8, it seems like, wow, okay, I've just won the game. But this is your only threat. You're actually not even threatening my bishop because I can take yours. So that means I can move my king anywhere. Anywhere. And I'm fine. I also could defend my bishop. I also could give you a check. But obviously, if it was black to play, they'd be winning. But if it, white has maybe eight moves that don't lose, I can, we well, could all, anything, anything here, and also all, any king move. So I'd probably say check is fine. Always consider your opponent's options. The mistake, especially my, uh, my students make, the, weak, the weaker ones is, or even the older ones, uh, all of them, is that they fail to consider their opponent's ideas. They're like, okay, they'll do something and I'll win material. Check. Yeah, no problem. It's all good. It's anonymous. Only I will know who wrote it. So we'll, we'll keep the secret between you and me, okay? Uh, the rest of the class might be thinking I'm just making stuff up. Maybe I'm just talking to myself right now. If they go check, we play King Ishley, and it seems like they have Queen one they're threatening me. Don't forget about this bishop that can come and defend it. Also, we can just take their bishop with check and then slide back. White is more than happy here. The issue with putting our king on h3, and maybe the people that haven't given the answer might be able to now, the king is all alone, all alone. There's nothing, none of their pieces are even close. Our queen is right there. We're absolutely cutting off their king. So how do we bring a new piece in to win the game in this position? How should we, how should we play? Yeah, of course. We're going to play bishop g1. Not g5. Because then they take our bishop with check. We need this bishop. We play bishop g1. We're threatening main one. And the most important thing is our king is able to hide on h6. So, okay, give me a check. Fine. You can't even give me a check on the default because my queen's controlling it. So, okay, give me a check. You've run out of checks, and it's time to resign. Because the only way you could hold on any longer is by losing your queen. So that's going to be one more move. But I promise you, if I were to turn on the engine right now, it would say made into for black here. Because white does, white's running out of illegal ways to defend the main. The bishop cannot just fly to g2. There's no way. Now, a lot of you are thinking, well, okay, well, the king doesn't have to go to h3. He can go to h1. But this is where we consider our most active, most aggressive moves here. How does black play made in three? You don't need to give me the white moves. Just give me the black moves. How does black mean three? Just give me the next three moves for black. Every move has to be check. I mean, probably there are moves that don't give check right away that result in victory, but always look for forcing moves first. Queen F2 does win, but it's unnecessary in this position.
Yeah, three moves. Yeah, almost everyone that everyone that has given me the three moves is correct. Uh, we're going to give a check on the back rank. It actually doesn't really matter which one. It actually doesn't matter at all, to be fair. Queen C1, Queen D1, Queen E1. I want you, to, though, to get in a habit of when you're attacking is to bring your pieces forward. Bring them as close to your opponent's king as possible. So Queen E1 should be the first thought. Luckily, in this position, it doesn't matter. In a lot of positions, it will. Um, obviously, white can throw away their queen, but I don't count that as a move. They're going to bring up their king. It doesn't really matter where. And in this position, you also want to cut your opponent's legal moves. For instance, if we play queen f2, this is a mistake because they have king h3. They don't have to play king h1. So always make moves or always consider moves. Give priority to the moves that give the least amount of legal moves for your opponent. And in, that, in this position, it is queen g1. There's actually no other winning move here. There's none. Queen f2 does not win. Queen f2 throws away the game. Goes from absolutely winning to a draw again. Queen g1 is the right answer. The king has to go to h3. And then we mate the king all on our own with our queen. Very rare, but white's pawns are stopping the king from running away. It is checkmate. So this is not a free pawn. So maybe we can put this in. I'll write it in. White is unable to take on why? Because it will solve in in a few moves. Okay. Oh, this is this this to give some advance uh, warning. This is kind of difficult for anyone that finds this. I will be impressed. Gregory cut while I. I'm going to be talking about him. You guys can think. Remember, I always encourage you to just think down one line and go deep down that one line. Go as deep as you can. If you feel like there's nothing there, you you should move on. That's what calculation is all about. Gary Kadinov, he's from actually he's from Soviet Union. He's actually a very very strong grandmaster, also a coach, and he found this just stunning idea. If we look at the material, it's even, but E6 is under a ton of pressure. Um, what's going on? Uh, Leo, you found most of the moves that I'm looking for. You've also always try to find the best refutation for your opponent. Yeah, I should address this because someone asked. If we go bishop takes d5, it seems like this move wins right? because if we take. There's going to be some ideas of back rank mate, right? Bishop takes mate. The issue is that the queen is able to take. And even though we're putting our queen on pre, we're going to take your, your queen. If your queen moves, we're going to take your rook. Okay, you take my queen? Great, I take your rook. You take back, and now I'm just up a piece. Of course, there's also back rank issues. I don't know, queen f7, not an easy move to find. Oh, okay, David and Glip, well done. So Leo gave me most of it, and, and David and Glip, you guys gave me that whole answer that I'm looking for. Really uh, stunning job. Look for forcing moves. What is the first move that comes to your mind? Always look for the most aggressive stuff. In this case, uh, the king is a little bit, a little bit weak. We're going to start off by taking the pawn. They're going to take with the bishop. And Jared, you actually gave me the right answer. You gave it to me in the wrong move order. You actually, it was actually basically completely correct. If if we take, they're able to take our queen. And this is an issue. But let's change it up and try to take advantage of our opponent's potential back rank. Don't be discouraged. The king is doing a horrible job on g8. We want to distract our opponent's pieces. And our queen's on under attack. And we're going to go straight ahead. We're going to sacrifice our queen. Stunning move. Okay, there's two moves. 
uh, that are legal in this position. There's rook takes and bishop takes. If bishop takes, how should we play? Notice if we distract this rook, this is checkmate. We're able to take the free pawn on d5. If they take, yes, the credit, yes. Yeah. And of course, if they ignore us, it's mate. And if they block, they're in no better position. And this, the hilarious thing here is no matter where the queen goes, it's going to be lost because of my discovered attack with my rook. I mean, think about literally any square. And my rook will move to attack it. There's no, there's no move you can move your queen to. I will attack. You go here, check. You go here, check. You go here, check. Bishop F7. What do you mean knight takes, Leo? What do you mean knight takes? So there's so they're going to take with the rook. How should we play if rook takes? Oh, okay. We take again, and it basically transposes to what we just looked at. We're going to take with the pawn we check. The king still can't go, and if Bishop F7. What do we do? I mean, we've we just talked about this. This is the advantage of calculating when you see two lines that are similar. Is usually they involve the exact same move. Uh, this position is no different. We have that same move here. What should we play here? Yeah, we can just take the bishop. Again, the queen has nowhere to go. Anywhere it moves, we'll attack it with a discovered check. If they take, it's like, oh my god, we're going to have to win this somehow. We're only up a pawn after all this. I actually would disagree with that kind of thinking because in this position, we can actually inflict more damage here. This is, let's see if anyone can find the best way for white to win even more material. Yeah, Leo, well done. Daniel, yeah, and then what's the following? I always encourage, especially in calculation, right? I'll always encourage you to do more than one move. In all my classes that I'll do, and if I ask for a move, giving me one move, you could always just luckily get, get the right answer. But then what's the following? Okay, Daniel, yeah, that's good. And then what? Yeah, but David, that's just a trade. I'll just take it. In fact, you may even be losing that endgame if I take your knight there. I mean, you're probably not. I'll just probably move my knight away, but it's totally unnecessary. Let's start off with knight g5, 100%. You're forcing your opponent's king away from the center, right? One of the basic rules of endgames is you want to get your king in the center of the board. You're going to check, hitting the king. And it actually doesn't matter where the king goes. Let's say king g6, more active. Where should we move our knight now? Hanging. Yeah, everyone that said anything is right, absolutely. We're going to play 96, attacking the pawn. If they push or defend the pawn, it actually doesn't change anything. Let's say they push. Right? And the point is that not only are we threatening this, we're going to take that too. So even knight c4 wouldn't work because they'll be losing two pawns for our one. So they're going to go c4. How should white play now uh, to win material? And now... Funny enough, the knight on a5 that never did anything continues to do nothing and is stuck amongst its pawns. Leo, why does it matter? What's the difference? There is knight d8. I mean, traps their knight, but it doesn't win material. Knight c5 and knight c7 both work. I mean, you're allowing, in either case, you're allowing the knight to escape. It doesn't really matter. We're just trying to win this pawn on a6. It can't move. And even if it could, then b5 would fall. I know, it seems like I, all that, yeah, Richard, we'll talk about that in this right here. All that just to win two pawns, like why? If they if they take with the queen, uh, as someone just asked, how should uh, white play? This will be the final variation in this position. 
Now you should feel confident in this position because it's most likely has to do with themes that we have already spoken about, ideas that we've already brought in this position. So I'm just looking for some variation of it. So the issue with bishop takes d5 is their queen can just take, and the rooks are adequately, the rook is adequately defended. I mean, a good thing to have, and I mean, I actually don't even, yeah, Richard, I agree. And I think Leo uh, gave me the same answer. A good thing to have in this position is kind of like a fail safe. In this position, there's just this like two move quick tactic. We're able to take their queen because if they take our queen, we make an in-between move here. We don't have to rush to take the rook because the rook is going to be hanging. What's an in-between move here that we could play prior to capturing their rook? We don't have to lose our rook for nothing. Yeah, like three of you are absolutely right. There's, I'll wait for a few more to find this move. Yeah, they can just take the pawn. It's checked. So they have to react to it. Whenever you're looking for in between moves, so that's before you do the obvious move. In this position, the obvious move is to take your the rook on e3. Before you make that obvious move, always consider a check or attacking something more powerful. So in this position, only thing more powerful than or more valuable than the rook is the king. So we only have two checks in this position. Rook f8 doesn't accomplish anything. We're just giving up the rook for nothing. But here we can just take the pawn. And I, I mean, I don't see anything better for white than this position. And this position is pretty good for white. We're able to get an active rook. I really don't see why white should be too concerned. I mean, obviously we've only won a pawn, but at least we won something. But obviously the main tactic was if bishop takes, seemingly holding the position together, that's where black's position falls apart. Uh, okay, uh, let me, for the people that didn't have, that came a little bit late, let me sauce you, drop the link here. We got a chance to do everything I wanted with calculation. And we weren't able to do two positions with Canada moves. I can put in the answers to these later. Uh, and I apologize for going a little bit over time. I hope you guys don't sue me. Um, I hope you guys enjoy that. I'm also like, I'll be, I'll be here to answer uh, any questions you guys have. One more thing before I do wrap up. I know a lot, a lot of people, uh, specifically in this class and in general, have, yeah, Frank, my pleasure have always a lot of questions about what are good ways to improve. So I, I, I wanna just touch on that before I kind of wrap things up and then open myself up to questions. The, it obviously, first of all, when it comes to improvement, it's totally, it, it's not always totally dependent on level. There's some, I'm gonna give some vague advice. And then there's some advice that um, they probably most likely haven't heard before. The very typical device that I will give that you've heard from everyone is, do tactics, you know, play, um, review your games. But I, I want to make sure that I want to say something, a few things that you may have not heard before. The first thing, this might be mildly surprising, is be careful of chess content creators. By that, I mean Twitch streamers and YouTubers. Majority, I actually would argue almost everyone here from the people I know are much better than the average chess player. I mean, it might be hard to imagine that, right? Because you go to a chess club and you see that you're in the bottom uh, three quarters and you're like, oh, everyone's better than me. But you're actually absolutely, that's actually the wrong perspective to have. Because if you think about it, most of the people don't even go to a chess club. Most people just play online. Those people that play, the average rating of a player online is incredibly low. And so when people create content, it's majority for these kind of players, for people that are starting out. And it's, of course, that clickbait nonsense where you're actually not learning anything. And in fact, I'd argue a lot of the material online that is incredibly popular is actually damaging 
these tricks, these traps, the whole point of damage, it damages your chest for the hope of like catching your opponent in some trick. So you're going to have this one beautiful game, but you're going to have 10 games where you're just starting with a disadvantage. A classic example is the Stafford Gambit. I mean, when my students were playing it two years ago, I wanted, I just wanted to burn my brain. I was like, what is going on? Like I'm five with black, you're objectively losing. Why is this good? Oh, well, my opponent fell for a trick here. I was able to win quickly. But we look at more of their games and they're just like losing with it all the time. I want to make clear, not all chess content creators are bad. I mean, I have some that I like. I really am a big fan of Nair Ditsky. But I would, in general, caution away from content creators. I, a lot of my privates would come up to me and say, well, you know, I'm just tired at night. It's 11 o'clock and X person is streaming. I'm by myself. I'm about to go to sleep and I just want to have it on. I would just say, in general, I'm speaking in generalities. Of course, as I just said, there are some that are good. I just specifically said Nerdisky. I don't know about all the other ones, but I really am a fan of Nerdisky. All the other, a lot of the other ones, they don't create good, healthy content. They just try to get the biggest audience. And that biggest audience, remember, it's the bottom of the chess pyramid. It is the weakest player. That's where most people are, right? The Twitch boom, the chess boom during COVID had sprung a lot of these people that never knew how to play chess. They got interested in it and they decide to play. Another thing is when you finish your games, I know a lot of you play in the Annex Chess Club, when you, rap, when you finish your game, do not analyze with an engine immediately. That shouldn't be your first thing. It shouldn't be like, okay, let me go home and just pump it out with an engine. My, my thing is when you turn on the engine, you turn off your brain, right? When you turn on the engine, you just stop thinking. You, don't, you no longer think, you, you believe that you thought of, of the variation that was provided, but you actually are not, you're lying to yourself. My recommendation, and I know this from personal experience because I did this all the time and I learned nothing. Like I turn on the engine, I'll be like, of course, how did I miss this 12 move tactic? Like, it's embarrassing to even have that sentence come out of my mouth. That wasn't even, it wasn't even on my radar. It wasn't on my opponent's radar. You know, it's, there's nothing you can learn from it. You should go back and analyze the game on your own. Create a leech study at chess.com, say whatever. And just write it down, write on like, okay, I move 12, I have this thought, I move 13, I have this thought, I was worried about this. And then after you put all your thoughts out and you laid it out, just check with the engine whether or not your thoughts were accurate or not, whether or not the engine agrees. Your, the engine should just be kind of like a double checking. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be just as soon as you turn it on, you know, because a lot of people, they go home late, out, late after a Monday game, they turn on the engine, they're like, okay, I made three inaccuracies and one blunder. I hope for better next time. You're not learning anything. And also that's actually not even the right approach because some games, like a lot of my games, they're very, very tactical, very, very, um, a lot of mistakes are going to be made. So of course, my games have a lot of blunders from both sides. Grandmasters blunder against me. I blunder against Grandmasters. However, I can show you two games from two 2000s that are going to make close to no mistakes, trading off all the pieces from the board. Does that mean that their quality of chess is better than mine? No, that's not even the right. That's not even the right mindset to have. Of course, when you do openings, that's completely different because openings is all about memorization, and I actually do think that openings is a very important tool for all of you to have, to have a basic set of openings. I know Michael Humphreys is doing a great job teaching openings uh, for the Annex Chess Club. I do recommend, uh, you know, trying him out. Uh, openings are incredibly important. Don't try to memorize every opening under the sun. Try to think about openings that fit your style. Are you an active player? Do you like positional? Do you like counterattacking? Do you like center? Do you like development? What are your, what are your biggest, what do you, what kind of, what kind of positions are you most comfortable with? You know, I like to tell the story. I once played a game in the morning round. I played two games in one day in a GM norm tournament, uh, two GMs. First round, it's completely losing, but I was really comfortable in the position. I was easily able to be my grandmaster. Second round, I was black. On a move 10, I memorized Roy Lopez through. Move 15, it was minus two. So I was completely winning. In 10 moves, I resigned. You want to put yourself in a position where you know what to do. Put yourself in, in positions where you're most comfortable with. That doesn't always have to align with engines. If you find openings that fit your style, you can do much better with them. So of course it's not, um, but you always, always try to pick things that you're most comfortable with. And when you do that, it'll become much easier for you to improve. Okay, I, I think I think those two are good. I, I'm now I'm, I've I've said a lot. I by the way, I really want to thank all of you for dealing with my rant. I speak a lot, so you know, every every girl I've ever been with 
has told me that I have this disease of not knowing when to stop talking. They're like, that's our job. So I, uh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll now, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, 